So we're looking at unit two, lesson seven, Rolle's theorem and mean value theorem. So we're gonna start off with Rolle's theorem here. It says, let F be continuous on a closed interval A to B and differentiable on the open interval A to B. If F of A equals F of B, then there is at least one point X equals C within the interval A to B where F prime of C equals zero. So we have some if conditions here. When you are given a theorem, those if conditions must be met for the theorem to apply. Otherwise you would just say, Rolle's theorem doesn't apply. So my conditions, number one is that F is continuous. So no holes, no breaks, no asymptotes. On a closed interval, so we have to include the two endpoints. But then it says differentiable on the open interval. And that's just really a technicality because remember a derivative is defined as a limit and limits are two-sided. I'd have to see the slope from the left and the right. And at an endpoint, you actually can't see that. So that's why they say on the open interval, just to not have an issue with the fact that we're closing off the endpoints. But basically, it's saying it's continuous and differentiable. So graphically, there'd be no hole, no break, no asymptote, and no sharp turn. Remember, differentiable, you can't have that corner or a cusp. So as long as we have it continuous and differentiable. Now, Rolle's theorem also has another if. If f of a is equal to f of b, now those are our y values. So if you look at the graph here, we've got two points defined as a and b. And f of a and f of b, those y values, if they're the same, then that means that they're at the same height. And if you connect them, you would have a horizontal line connecting them. That means the slope connecting those endpoints is zero. So what Rolle's theorem is guaranteeing is that at some points along the way in between here, the derivative would also be equal to zero. You can look at this graphically to see that it means that you would then have a horizontal tangent line as well as the horizontal line connecting it. So let's write out in words a couple of the things that this means. First, it's saying if the y values are equal, so if f of a equals f of b, if f of a equals f of b, there is at least one horizontal tangent. There is at least one horizontal tangent or in other words relative extreme value relative extrema on this interval from a to b that's what's so powerful about Rolle's theorem is that you would then be guaranteed that there's that turning point, that relative extreme value. Now on this one, it's a relative minimum because our function curved below those Y values. But even if it went up and above, basically in order to start at one Y value and wind up back there again, you have to have at least one turning point or one relative max or min. And that's what Rolle's theorem is describing. Rolle's theorem is actually a specialized case of the mean value theorem. So I don't know how he did it. I don't know how he got his name on one specialized case of the mean value theorem. But history buffs, if you want to look that up, you can enlighten me on how he got his name on the zero for mean value theorem. Because if we look at the mean value theorem below, it's saying the same thing, except it's saying any slope not just zero, Rolle's theorem is stuck on the zero and guaranteeing we have that relative extrema. Mean value theorem is saying, you're gonna have to have the tangent line have a slope that's the same as the secant line as long as you're on a continuous closed interval. So let's take a look at this officially. Mean value theorem, which we are allowed to abbreviate as MVT, let F be continuous on a closed interval A to B 
and differentiable on the open interval, which just means continuous and differentiable. But notice now there's no condition about the y values. The y values can be anything. So here, my f of a is, I don't know, maybe two-ish. And then it ends f of b. Let's pretend maybe that's seven. I'm just making up numbers. Totally different y values. What mean value theorem says then is that there's at least one point where f prime at c, which is the derivative, is equal to the slope between those endpoints. The derivative is equal to the slope through the endpoints on the interval. That slope is called, or uh, well, that line that connects the endpoint is called the secant line. So this is saying that the derivative is equal to the slope, and let's be a little bit more technical, of the secant line at least once. Visually, you're still going to see those parallel lines. So it's guaranteeing that the tangent line is parallel to the secant line at least once. Because remember, parallel means same slope. And the derivative is the slope of the tangent. And the change in y over change in x is the slope of the secant line. A third way that we can explain the mean value theorem is that the derivative is that instantaneous rate of change, whereas the slope of the secant line is the average rate of change. So mean value theorem is basically saying that the derivative or the instantaneous rate of change, I'm going to abbreviate it as IROC, is equal to the slope of the secant, which is the average rate of change. IROC equals AROC is the mean value theorem. I'm not giving you all of these ways to describe it to confuse you. I'm letting you know all the different ways that they're going to ask the question that you're going to say, oh, they're replying, replying or referring to the mean value theorem. The derivative equals the slope in the secant line. The instantaneous rate of change is equal to the average rate of change. This is what we're talking about. So how are we going to solve these? Let's write out some steps before we do our examples. First thing is you have to consider if the criteria are met. So number one, consider if the function is continuous and differentiable on the domain or on the interval. Consider if f of x is continuous and differentiable on the interval. Because if it's not, then you're going to save yourself a lot of work. You're going to say mean value theorem doesn't apply. You can't use the theorem if it doesn't meet the criteria in the if. If it is continuous and differentiable, step two, you're going to find the average rate of change, which is the slope of the secant. Just like with Rolle's theorem, where we have to make sure the y values are the same, that's to guarantee that the slope is zero. With these, the y values are going to be different, and you're going to actually have to calculate the slope. Next thing, you're going to have to find the derivative. Because with average rate of change and the derivative or the instantaneous rate of change is going to be step four, set them equal to each other and solve for x. So 
set them equal, and solve for x. And we're going to see through our examples that when we get our values of x, we do have to double check that they are within the interval. You might get an answer that's out of the interval, so you reject it. But we'll see that as we come across some of our examples. All right, so this is our mean value theorem and Rolle's theorem. Let's do some examples. On the top of the next page, we're starting off with Rolle's theorem. All right, determine whether Rolle's theorem can be applied on the indicated interval. And if it can be applied, find the values that satisfy the theorem. So when you're looking for if it can be applied or not, fractions, square roots, and log or natural log, these are the functions that we have that have domain restrictions and issues we'd have to be worried about right off the bat. So in this number one, I see a polynomial. It's continuous. It's differentiable. There's no issues. So I have to check Rolle's theorem now. Since they're specializing on Rolle's here, I need to see that the y values are the same. So let's plug in f at zero. Oops, I think I just lost my earring. I'll find it later. So plugging in zero, we get a one. And f at three. So three cubed minus nine times three plus one. So we've got 27 minus 27 plus one. Yep, I get one both times. F at zero is one, F at three is one. So now I just have to make a little statement. F of X is continuous and differentiable and F at zero equals F at three. So Rolle's theorem applies. I'm gonna start off with Rolle's theorem applies. because f of x is continuous and differentiable. And f at zero is equal to f at three. So we're good to go. Since we see that we have these equal y values, we don't have to calculate the average rate of change. We know it's a zero. So all I need is the derivative. The derivative, a nice easy power rule. And now I'm gonna set that derivative equal to zero because that's what Rolle's theorem is guaranteeing, that the derivative or the slope of the tangent is also zero at some point. So I can factor out a three. When I divide both sides by three, zero divided by anything is still zero. Mm, this isn't perfect squared, so I'm gonna have to add over that three and square root. Now when I square root myself, I really have two answers, positive and negative square root of three. And they could both possibly be an answer, except take a look at our interval. We are actually only on the interval from zero to three. So we are not including the negative square root of three because it's out of the interval. So the X value that we're guaranteed to have is square root of three only, positive square root of three. Oops, what did I do there? There we go. Questions? All right. Number two, we're going to continue without calculator. What I'm sneaking into this lesson, besides mean value theorem and Rolle's theorem, is a little bit of review working with trig functions and solving trig equations and all that fun stuff. So let's look at number two. The function is sine of pi x on the interval from zero to two. Sine curves, continuous, differentiable, no issues there. Let's check to see if the y values at the end are the same. Let's f at zero, the sine of pi times zero. 
Well, I need my sine curve or my uh, sine unit circle. The I in sine is my one. And I got the negative one on the bottom and the zeros on both sides. So sine of zero is zero. That's over here on the right side, zero degrees. So F at zero is zero. What about F at two? Sine of pi times two. Well, pi times two is two pi. And hey, that brings me around the circle once. We around the circle, but then I'm right back here. This is two pi, so it's also zero. So I satisfy Rolle's theorem. Got a little statement. I have to write a sentence saying that. Rolle's theorem applies. Because f of x is continuous and differentiable. And f at 0 equals f at 2. So we can go ahead and use Rolle's theorem. Rolle's theorem is then saying that we're guaranteed that the derivative is 0 at least once along the way. So I need the derivative here. This derivative is maybe a little bit harder because it's a chain rule. Derivative of sine is cosine. And I have to keep my pi x on the inside but then zoom in and multiply by the derivative of pi x, that's times another pi. So we need to set this equal to zero. I'm gonna put the pi in front of cosine, just because, and I want this equal to zero. Well, just like before, we divided away the three, I could divide away pi the same way, divide both sides by pi, and zero divided by anything is still zero. So I've got cosine of pi x equals zero. Now, technically, to get rid of cosine, we need the inverse of cosine or cos inverse. You could write that as the cos to the negative one or arc cosine. But basically, what arc cosine is asking us is what angle has a cosine of zero? So I could use my cosine unit circle to figure out where is cosine zero. Well, cosine zero up at the top, so that's our pi over two or 90 degrees. And down at the bottom, three pi over two or 270 degrees. Now, if we kind of visualize that what we're really doing is taking the inverse cosine of both sides, what we're looking at is a couple of different options. That pi x angle, that's equal to pi over 2. Or the pi x angle is equal to 3 pi over 2. Or really, as many times as I want to spin around this unit circle. But before I start writing out an infinite set of ors, let's get these two and then see how we have to tweak it in terms of what fits in our interval. So if we divide both sides by pi, it's going to cancel pi out, and I get x equals 1 half. My interval is 0 to 2, so x equals 1 half. That fits in there, so we're good to go with that. Divide both sides by pi over here, I get 3 halves, which is like 1 and a half. Again, fits in my interval. So... If I were to keep going, if I was going to go to 5 pi over 2 and 7 pi over 2, these numbers are getting too big. They're out of the interval. There's no negatives that I need for this interval, so these are my two solutions. Remember, you're guaranteed at least one, but there can be two or more. Questions? All right, so let's step away from Rolle's theorem and just go to our generalized mean value theorem. Starting with determine if the mean value theorem can be applied or not. And if it can, find the values. 
Number one is a nice polynomial function. So mean value theorem applies. It's continuous and differentiable. We have to write it. Mean value theorem applies because f of x is continuous and differentiable. I could say on the interval from negative one to two, but it's really continuous and differentiable for all real numbers. So this is good enough. I don't even have to specify on the interval. So I can go ahead with mean value theorem. So I need two things. I need the average rate of change and the instantaneous rate of change. Just like with Rolle's theorem, let's get the y values, except this time we're not checking if they're the same. We actually just need the y values. All right, let's save ourselves a little bit of time and let's do this one with the calculator. I wrote myself a note and I forgot to look at it. it said save time, use calculator. So let's listen to me. Oops, sorry that I'm bouncing all over the place here, guys, with the screen. All right, so if I'm gonna save time with my calculator, I'm gonna plug in x cubed minus 2x squared plus x minus 5 and just use the table of values because it'll give me all the y values that I want. And I want at negative 1, this is negative 9. And then at 2, I'm just going to pull right from the table, is negative 3. Once you have your y values this time, again, if it's not Rolle's theorem, we're not saying zero every time, we need to calculate the average rate of change. So the average rate of change is change in y, so negative three minus that negative nine over change in x, two minus the negative one. Minus a negative becomes plus a positive. 6 divided by 3, my average rate of change is 2. And I'm going to kind of put that to the side for a second because I need average rate of change, but then I also need the instantaneous rate of change, which is the derivative. The derivative is actually a nice, easy power rule, so I'm going to sneak it right here. 3x squared minus 4x plus 1. And what mean value theorem does is it pulls these two things together and wants us to set them equal. So I want to know where 3x squared minus 4x plus 1 equals 2. And since we're using our calculator to save time, let's plug in. Because otherwise we need quadratic formula. <laughs> no, thank you. 3x squared minus 4x plus 1. And then in y2, I'm putting a 2. Let's take a look at the graph. Zoom 6 kind of resets your window to a standard window so that you can see the graph. And let's calculate the intersection. So we've got second, calculate, intersect. You get to hit enter three times. I've got this knockoff calculator. All right, I'm getting an intersection of x equals negative 0.21 five, three decimal places minimum. Are we keeping or are we rejecting it? In the interval, keeping it. Next one, second, calculate intersect. This side, I'm getting 1.54, we'd have to round that up to a 9. Keeping that 1, 2. My interval is from negative 1 to 2, so I've got two values here. Mean value theorem, since it applied, it's guaranteeing at least one, we found two. Questions?
Lindsay. Do we have to say every time why the uh, why the rule applies? If it's a free response like this, yes. Okay. But a lot of times these show up in multiple choice. Um, also, sometimes in free response, you've already kind of established or stated that the function was continuous okay. in part A, B. And by the time you get to the mean value theorem part, you don't have to re-say it if it's already been mentioned in the, um, in the beginning. Sometimes they save you writing it by in the free response question, setting up that F is a continuous and differentiable function defined by blah, blah, blah. And then since if they give you that information, then you don't have to re-say it because you're being told it. So that's another time that you can save writing the sentence. All right, number two, mean value theorem applies. Is there a problem with one value in this? Is four in our interval? Yeah. Mean value theorem doesn't apply because X equals four is a discontinuity in the interval. Mean value theorem does not apply because X equals four is a discontinuity in the interval. Now, if this was a different interval, if it was the interval from one to three, then you're good to go. It just cannot include the discontinuity um, and this one did. And right there is a good example as to why I'm saying you should think about that first. Doing a derivative and calculating the average rate of change is all gonna wind up to an equation that you cannot solve because mean value theorem doesn't apply. All right, we're going back non-calculator for the last two, just because we need to start getting used to this. Half of your AP is non-calculator, and we have to get comfortable working with um, values that are not decimals. So number three, I see X minus two sine X. None of these are giving me any type of undefined or discontinuous point. Um, so we just need to say we're good to go. Mean value theorem applies. Because f of x is continuous and differentiable And again, I could just leave it continuous and differentiable because it's really continuous and differentiable everywhere. If you wanted to write on the interval, that's fine as well. All right, so I need two things. I need average rate of change. That means I need y values so I could calculate the slope. So let's start there. F at negative pi. And I'm not using calculator anymore, which means I want answers in terms of pi. All right, let's get our unit circle for sine to help us out here. I and sine is the one on the top. Now negative pi just brings us in the opposite direction, but it's still gonna be over here. So zero, negative pi minus two times zero is just gonna be negative pi. And then we plug in positive pi. So pi minus two times sine of pi I'm still going to that zero. Now this time I'm just going the positive way around. Why does this apply if there's like no interval? This isn't negative pi and pi both 180. Right, but you're actually going from negative pi to positive pi. So like you're starting okay. here and going this way in terms of like that's the, the chunk of the graph. Got it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we've got pi minus, again, two times zero, which is just pi. Now that we have our y values, we can calculate a rock, average rate of change. Pi minus negative pi. Huh, it's the same over x values are also pi minus negative pi. Yeah, it's just going to be one. You could go to the step two pi over two pi, but once you realize you're dividing by itself, we jump to one. All right, we'll put our 
average rate of change on hold. Now I need my derivative. All right, the derivative is derivative of x is 1. The derivative of sine is cosine. That constant multiple stays there. Oops. So 1 minus 2 cos x. Mean value theorem is going to take this average rate of change, set it equal to the derivative, and ask us to solve for x. Let's subtract over 1. Divide by negative 2. 0 divided by anything is still 0. All right, so where is cos x 0? Cos x was on the other page, so let's get my unit circle up here again. The O and cosine is my 0. So I'm 0 at the top, pi over 2, then the bottom, 3 pi over 2. Uh-oh. 3 pi over 2 is out of the interval, not in the domain we're working with. But this is going back to negative pi. So besides positive pi over 2, negative pi over 2. So now this interval is forcing me to think about, oh, yeah, the unit circle does kind of keep swinging around and in either direction. And now this one wanted me to come up with both the positive and the negative pi over 2 as the solutions. 3 pi over 2 is out of the interval, even though it was probably one of the first things you were considering. Questions? All right, last one. Again, I picked this one to really push the idea that you might have to work with numbers that are not nice round whole numbers on a non-calculator part. Function is lin x on the interval from 1 to 3. Now, natural log does actually have um, an issue in terms of its domain. You can only take the natural log, or any log for that matter, of positive numbers. Got to be greater than zero. Our interval is one to three. So we're fine. Mean value theorem applies. Because f of x is continuous. And differentiable but now I have to say on the interval from 1 to 3 because saying f of x when it's lin of x is continuous and differentiable that is implying everywhere and that is not true it's only continuous and differentiable for x greater than 0 and this interval happens to be part of that so that's why we're allowed to go ahead all right, so I need average rates of change to start. F at 1. The lin of 1. Oh, what's the lin of 1? Zero. Zero. Nice. F of 3. I don't have the same. Ooh, who knows what the lin of 3 is? Only your calculator. We have to leave this as lin of 3. The only ones you know... Lin of 1 is 0, and the lin of e, those are inverses, would be 1. Other than that, we have to leave it in terms of natural log. So our average rate of change, change in y over change in x, the lin of 3 minus 0 over 3 minus 1 is leaving us with the lin of 3 divided by 2. Okay, if I'm not allowed to use my calculator, that's all I can do. I still need the derivative though. What is the derivative? <laughs> I keep drawing the diagonal line. What is the derivative of lin x? We're in the very beginning of this one unit. Nice, one over x. And my mean value theorem says, take that derivative, that instantaneous rate of change, that slope of the tangent line, and it's got to be equal to our average rate of change, which is the lin of 3 over 2, at least once. I'm going to say let's cross multiply. Lin of 3 times x equals 2. So x is equal to 2 divided by the lin of 3. 
Now, I just did all that talking about, is it in the interval? Is it not in the interval? So how do you know when you're working with something like this? Well, you're not gonna get the exact decimal, but you can just take a second to logic your way through it. First of all, lin of three has to be positive. The natural log function crosses over the x-axis at one zero. And this is something that you would wanna be able to know that from zero to one, lin is negative, and then anything greater than one, it's positive. So I'm dividing two positive numbers, so I have no worry that this is negative. Then the whole number in the top, I'm dividing two by some positive number. So it definitely feels reasonable that this is within the interval from one to three. So I'm comfortable saying that this is my answer and that I don't have to reject it. Questions? 